as a lecturer in human geography. He is author of Public-Private Partnerships in Ireland, A Home or a Wealth uh, Generator, Inequality, Financialization, and the Irish Housing Crisis, and co-author of Cherishing All Equity. And he is also active in housing and social justice campaigns. Today, Rory is going to talk, about, uh, talk to us about financialization, inequality, and the right to housing in post-crisis Ireland. Thanks, Rory. Okay, morning or afternoon everyone, um, thanks for the introduction, thanks for coming along to the talk. So, um, as in terms of it, the title of what I'm going to talk about today, um, it's the area of financialization of housing inequality in housing um, and crisis and solidarity and social movements response. So it's quite a broad area, I'm going to try and give you a run through um, and then in terms of the questions you can ask in more detail. The context is looking at Ireland post 2008, what's called the post crisis period. Um, in the literature, generally the crisis is referred to as the 2008 crisis, but of course in Ireland here, um, um, we would argue that, and I've argued on this, that we've been in a continual crisis prior to the actual crisis in terms of property, um, but also then post the crisis, we have continued crisis in housing. So it's this idea of the contested idea of crisis. And this is based on, as I mentioned, research that I've undertaken as part of um, my PhD, but also as part of postdoctoral research, uh, policy engagement as a community worker, and also as a policy analyst and activism and social justice campaigns. Um, and I've written quite a bit around these areas, um, which there are references are there. You can look at them if you'd like in terms of following up on what I present on. So the first question is who's crisis uh, in housing in Ireland at the moment? And we can see that there's a number of groups or categories who are affected by this crisis. We look at first in terms of affordability. Um, as a result of the economic crisis, we have an austerity policies. We've seen the rise of poverty and deprivation. And as a result, housing costs. Um, people have found it more difficult to afford housing costs. So, Focus Ireland did a survey in November of 2016, which found that a third of people um, were worried about or struggling to pay their rent or mortgage. That's a very significant proportion of the population. Um, we also then have homelessness and the emergence since 2014 of the new phenomenon in Ireland of family homelessness, particularly lone parents and their children becoming homeless. And then we also have tenants. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about, about this in the next slide, we have private tenants. So in Ireland, the number and proportion of households who are in the private rental sector has increased significantly over the last number of years, increasing from approximately 145,000 households in 2006 to over doubling to, in 2016, 340,000 households. A fifth of the population are now in the private rental sector. And this is a very significant change for housing um, in Ireland, and particularly given the context of a private rental sector that is insecure in terms of tenure, and this question of quality, and of course, since 2013, significantly rising um, rental costs. We also then have the legacy of the previous 2008 crash crisis, more homeowners in mortgage arrears, and this crisis is still playing out. Uh, 25,000 cases of home repossession have been in the courts, before the courts in recent years, we have the issue of the vulture funds. We also have overcrowding in households as housing has become more, more unaffordable. We have more people staying at home, unable to purchase a home, but also within the social housing sector as people who would traditionally have got council housing or social housing, they can't access it and they are also becoming overcrowded, staying longer in the family home. Um, and we have generally this issue then associated with the rise in housing need. So the increase in the number of households who are on what are called the social housing waiting lists. So this increased from 43,000 households in 2005, reaching almost 100,000 households in 2011. And in 2016, it was around 90,000, so equivalent to what it was in 2011. But importantly, if uh, tenants who are in receipt of social housing subsidies, either the rental accommodation scheme or the housing assistance payment who are in the private rental sector, if they're included as needing housing, the households on waiting lists would be around 130,000 households in need of some form uh, of social housing. We then have the issue, which you'd obviously be familiar with in Limerick, in terms of substandard local authority, 
housing estates, the issue of dislocation, degeneration, and then we have groups on the margins of society who um, suffer some of the most social exclusion are also affected by this crisis and more so than many others, um, particularly people who have been victims of domestic violence, who aren't counted in the homelessness figures. We have travellers, um, those in direct provision, migrants, those with disabilities, um, who are often not considered in terms of the housing crisis. And then we also have students facing significant costs of accommodation, trying to access accommodation, and we have a wider issue then of commuting in communities. So what I'm showing here is this crisis isn't just a narrow crisis or some temporary blip. This is a deep structural crisis that we're going through in Ireland in terms of housing. Um, and I'll argue as I go through the talk that this is a very significant shift in our housing system and one that requires significant um, engagement with by policymakers and academics and those in wider society if we're, if we're going to solve it or move beyond the idea of um, what I call a permanent crisis um, for housing or for households. Um, that table just shows counts I put together for the task report that I did um, last year. I put together the different households who are affected by some form of housing exclusion. You probably can't see the numbers there. I included people on rent supplement who weren't included on the housing waiting list, those on the housing assistance payment, those on the waiting list, those in mortgage arrears over 90 days, um, those in direct provision, travellers, um, who are homeless and domestic violence, uh, people who are domestic violence refugees, and it came to around 211,000 households who are affected in some level by housing, severe housing stress. Um, and of course, this is not to mention those people who are in overcrowding situations uh, or aspirant homeowners. So this as a housing crisis is very significant. If we look then at the most extreme end of it, we have homelessness and um, those who are suffering most, the deepest inequalities in housing, um, and we have, as I mentioned earlier, the emergence of what's called family homelessness. Um, since 2013, 2014, this rapid rise in the number of families becoming homeless. And these are predominantly lone parents, about 70% of them are lone parents. And of course, this isn't surprising if you're familiar that lone parents have been um, suffered most under austerity. Their, their deprivation rates are much, much higher than um, other households. They've suffered from austerity, exclusion from the, the workplace, um, and poverty, and the lack of social housing, combined with the lack of protection in the private rental sector, has led to this rise in homelessness and homeless families. We see it significantly in Dublin, and the latest figures um, that I put together just from this month, or from last month, showed that the number of, for example, families who are homeless in Dublin in over the last two years has increased from 769 families to over 1,191. In children, in terms of children, we see a rise from 1,500 children homeless in emergency accommodation from January 2016 to 2,500 in January 2018. We're now over 3,200 children homeless in emergency accommodation in um, Ireland. And of course, this is only families who enter emergency accommodation. This isn't the total number of families that are becoming homeless every month who are being supported into different forms of accommodation. Um, Focus Ireland estimates is approximately 80 to 100 families a month becoming homeless in Dublin alone. What I talked about then about this idea of a structural shift in the housing system, um, and this really hasn't been taken on board, I think, significantly in Ireland um, and wider that this decline in home ownership for many people Ireland is the, the kind of the country where home ownership is something that has been achieved on a widespread basis and within the housing literature in terms of social policy sociology and um, Ireland would be considered one of those societies at a very very high level of home ownership but in fact what has happened is during the crisis and austerity um, but it was starting before that um, a few years in the run-up the, the latter years of the Celtic Tiger we see this collapse of home ownership rate. Um, and why that is essentially is because we've had an ongoing increase in population, household formation, but people have not been able to access home ownership or traditional social housing, so people have gone into the private rental sector. So we've seen this increase, significant increase in the number of households in the private rental sector. And it's interestingly, when, we, when I go on to talk about the causes of this crisis, um, and argue that it's embedded in neoliberal policies. We look at the two countries that have pursued what are called neoliberal policies the most in housing, the house ownership dream through the markets. It has been Ireland and the UK. 
yet the, we are the two countries that have had the most significant drop in home ownership um, in this period from 2007. Ireland, we almost had 80% home ownership to 68% in 2014. That is a dramatic collapse. Um, and those of you who study housing systems and, and know that housing systems generally don't change rapidly. So this is a form of shock that the Irish housing system has undergone, and of course, households within that. In urban areas, um, the level of home ownership is even less. In Dublin, um, it's a, around 55%. Now we have almost half and half home ownership. And this is important when we think about the politics of housing later on and consider who is policy made for. Um, and, the, at the, and it's still, I would argue, made for predominantly homeowners and this idea of aspire, aspiring to home ownership rather than considering this change that's taken place. There's also, of course, within the social stratification, within uh, house, o house ownership, these are just average figures. They don't tell you within groups, within classes, what is the level of home ownership. And if we look at um, those who have incomes above 60% of the median income, their home ownership rate is 70%. Whereas for those below 60% of the median income, their home ownership rate is less than 50%. So there's also an inequality in terms of home ownership and the decline of home ownership has happened mostly for young people, but also for low income households. Um, so then to go on to the roots of the crisis, the causes of this crisis, and what I would argue and many other critical scholars um, in urban studies and geography and sociology would argue coming from a, a um, kind of broad critical uh, perspective would argue and have shown is that the deep roots of this crisis lie in what's called this process of neoliberalism, of commodification, financialization and marketization of housing. Essentially the move in housing from being the state playing a very significant important role in directly providing affordable housing or housing to rent and um, what would be considered social housing or council housing to housing being increasingly provided through the market um, and that might be called a process of commodification or even privatization where the private sector is playing a much greater role in providing social housing but then there's a wider process of financialization taking place where housing is increasingly and real estate um, from the 1980s, 1990s increasingly, but up to the present day, um, and financialization has become a key area of study now, this way in which kind of mobile capital or this um, in the financial markets, the huge wealth that has been accumulated, this huge capital that has been accumulated, has looked to real estate and housing as a key area for further investment and wealth accumulation. So housing itself has not just been privatized, um, it has also been financialized. It has been turned into a commodity whereby financial institutions finance can profit significantly from. Um, and there's various um, authors like Arigi and Desiree Fields have written about this, and um, also Madeleine Marcuse about what financialization actually is and the way in which um, sort of housing and householders become a asset and a commodity of the market. And of course that's the broad kind of political economy explanation of the, the deep roots of this crisis. But what I show in, the res in my research is how this has played out in Ireland and we can see these trends and processes taking place in Ireland. If we look at, for example, um, social housing provision, we can see there in the bottom left the graph showing um, that's the, the production or building of social housing by local authorities. Um, in Ireland, the, the red line down the left is where voluntary housing associations um, or not-for-profit housing associations are building social housing. And what we can see here is through the, from the 1970s, and of course this happened even previous to that, from the 1930s onwards, the Irish state played a very significant role in building uh, local authority housing, um, and much of which was bought then by tenants through various supported home ownership schemes and also gave out mortgages affordable mortgages to people. And at the height of it, in 1970, I can't remember the exact year, I think 76, 77, uh, local authorities built around seven to 8,000 social housing units directly. Then we had our austerity period in the 1980s where social house building collapsed um, as a result of cuts to budgets um, and the economic crash then. But then we see this increase in social housing building again through the 2000s 
But at this point, social housing was a much, much smaller proportion of the overall housing that was built. So in the um, 2000s, we had 70, 80,000 houses been built a year. Social housing was only around seven or 8,000, or sorry, not seven, five or 6,000. So you're talking less than 10% of housing being built was social housing. So, and then we see the austerity period from 2010 onwards, where we have this effectively stop, stopping or cessation of construction of social housing in Ireland. The parallel process or how marketization has taken place through social housing in Ireland has, has been this shift to the reliance on the private rental sector to provide social housing. So, um, and Rebuilding Ireland, which was the government's uh, flagship housing policy plan released in 2016 as, um, as a kind of first overall comprehensive housing strategy, um, acknowledges this and it talks about this, a quote from it, where it says over the past 20 to 30 years, housing provision has moved from a model where a significant share of overall annual housing delivery was accounted for by direct provision, mainly local authority housing, often in large public housing schemes, with the remainder provided by the private housing market, to a model where housing provision has been predominantly provided by the private market, and um, with social housing delivered thereafter through various rental sector schemes. And so what we see then is through the 1990s in particular, this increase in reliance on the rent supplement, which was a, subs a subsidy that low-income households could receive in the private rental sector. It was only considered a short-term support. It wasn't considered an actual form of social housing. It was a short-term income support. And we see the numbers increasing, um, particularly in the run-up to the crisis, but also through the, the latter years of the Celtic Tiger, as people unable to afford their housing in the private rental sector. Um, and what we see then is the emergence in 2008 of the rental accommodation scheme, which is another subsidy that tenants get in the private rental sector. But this time it's actually referred to as a form of social housing. Um, and we see the green then, what's called the housing assistance payment, which you might have heard some discussion about, also a uh, subsidy to tenants in the private rental sector. But the significant shift that's taking place is that the rent supplement was only a short-term income support, whereas the rental accommodation scheme and the housing assistance payment are considered forms of social housing. Um, and the 2011 housing policy statement uh, has, includes this within it, where we see this redefining of what social housing is, from something that was considered as a permanent, directly provided by the state, to something that is much more temporary. Um, and I would argue later on that this is a reduction in what is considered uh, a form of the right to housing because the private rental is in sector is insecure. It's not a secure form of housing. and um, Tenants can be um, evicted quite easily. So this is a significant shift in how social, what social housing is, but also how it's provided. Um, and we see here in this bottom right hand side, the, the light blue, at the bottom is local authority completions, and we see essentially they disappear in 2010 and 11 as the austerity cuts to budgets really hit, um, and we see the reliance of the private rental sector to deliver social housing. And this is quite important when I go to look at explaining partially why we're in this crisis, because I would argue that this shift is actually a significant factor in explanation for the current housing crisis in the broadest uh, sense of that crisis. Then um, this Rebuilding Ireland then enshrines this policy further. Uh, we see that in terms of the numbers of, so Rebuilding Ireland plans to provide um, 134,000, as it's called, social housing, now it refers to them as solutions rather than units, over between now and 2021. Um, the majority of those, the overwhelming majority of those are to come from the private rental sector in either the housing assistance payment um, or in the private market through the rental accommodation scheme or part five where you get it from private developers. Only 30% is actually social housing, even less than that is actually new build social housing. Um, so we see this whole area of how figures around social housing are manipulated. Um, so these are the austerity cuts to social housing where I show, and um, this is from the task chapter again, that um, if 
the, the cut, when the cuts were happening and the reduction in the budget was happening, we see this reduction in the numbers. In 2009, there was 3,000 social housing uh, units built by local authorities, 2,000 by housing associations, there was 5,000 units built in that year. We see then 2012, it drops down to just 1,000 built, and in 2015, just 400 built. Um, over the period then, we see that if those austerity cuts hadn't taken place, we would have an additional 30,000 permanent social housing units built over that period. We wouldn't have a homelessness crisis that we have now um, if austerity hadn't happened. So when they argue that austerity worked, in actual fact, this is the result um, of some of the austerity decisions. Overall then, these policies have led to a system uh, situation whereby when we look at the Irish housing system in comparative to other countries, we see that we've quite a low level of social housing. In Ireland, we've approximately 10% um, of our total housing stock is social housing. We look at other countries, for example, even England, 18%. But countries like Denmark, Austria, Scotland, Netherlands, is 32% of its housing stock, of stock is social housing. Um, so we see there's a very significant difference between the Irish housing system and these other uh, European countries, which haven't, of course, had the same level of crisis that we have had, or same level of homelessness. Um, Minton has talked about this process where I talk about moving from permanent social housing, what are called the bricks, the building of social housing by the state, to benefits, social benefits, and um, social housing being provided as essentially a subsidy to low-income uh, households. Um, the, the context is so I, where I make the argument is that this strategy uh, of this marketization of social housing, the reliance on the private market, actually worsens the private market crisis because, um, and you're well aware that we do have this wider uh, crisis within the private rental sector, for example, but also within the private housing system as a result of the crash, the lack of new building um, by developers, and the lack of supply in the rental sector, but also um, the increasing purchase, this uh, graph that I drew out is from the CSO, which shows the purchase of housing by non-household um, owners. And we see from 2014, this increase in non-occupier purchasers. From 2014 onwards, there was increasing housing being bought in Ireland as an investment, um, as of course rents rose, um, and by vulture funds, but also real estate investment trusts. And so this marketization impact has had a number of impacts. Firstly, um, the re increased reliance on the private rental sector to provide social housing, it actually pushes up demand. So you have not just private households trying to get housing in the rental sector, you have the state trying to access social housing through the rental sector. So that demand adds to increasing rents. Um, and of course, we don't have the increase, the state playing the role of increasing the supply of social housing. So it exacerbates the rental crisis. Um, and now we have a situation where a third of all tenancies in the private rental sector are some form of social housing, or receive of some form of social housing support. So if the state had actually built that social housing, we wouldn't again have this crisis in the private rental sector. Um, the other issue, of course, and I'll talk about this later in terms of um, the value for money, is we have the, the, those subsidies, as rents rise, have to keep increasing. So the state, in order to ensure people can keep accessing housing, have to increase the subsidy that they're giving. And um, so it's this increase in cost. The um, other area then that has, has developed within the Rebuilding Ireland, but also something that I've been looking from further on, is public-private partnerships, the building of um, private uh, housing on public land, the regeneration of former local authority housing estates, um, and we have this situation whereby in the midst of a housing crisis, we have significant land bank banks owned by the state, owned by local authorities, um, lying idle, and their strategy being, some of them lie idle, some of them of course are partially, their social housing on them, estates like O'Devney Gardens, St Michael's, we have great examples in Limerick, lots of public land where you have social housing lying there. But because the state has made this ideological decision that it's no longer building what it calls mono-tenure social housing estates and it's turning to the market to provide housing, it is going through this process where it has, and um, this is an ad from the, the paper uh, last year from the newspaper put in the national newspapers, 
some international papers as well by Dublin City Council advertising these three land plots to developers to see if they're interested in building on it. Of course, one of them um, actually has some social housing on it already, but they're still in the process of trying to engage developers. Are they interested? Are they not? Again, rather than just building on it, the state is engaging in this complex process which financializes that, that public land because the land is then dependent on what is built, becomes dependent on what financial investors and developers are interested in building and not actually um, what is necessarily needed. So we have this crisis, this, this process, as I was talking about earlier, of financialization, where housing uh, investors are increasingly interested in housing as an investment asset. And what's interesting is pre the crisis, that was generally through mortgages or lending to home ownership. But post the 2008 crisis, it has become the rental sector, has become the private rental sector, has become a key target for global finance, global investors. Um, to invest in the real estate sector. Um, and what we see is that Ireland has used this process of financialization as a key strategy for recovery. So a lot of the time when we see this discussion in the public domain around the housing crisis, how did we get here? It's like almost this natural disaster that just happened to us. In actual fact, this crisis results, results directly from government policies that have been pursued but not just pursued and they're an accident or a you know, kind of collateral damage. The policymakers knew what was going to happen. It was intentional because the two things that were key to considering achieving the Irish recovery was NAMA and the Irish banks. The Irish state decided and wanted to get rid of and wind up NAMA as quickly as possible, and particularly with Fine Gael under government and Michael Noonan, that strategy uh, really became embedded one of selling off the properties and to do that um, the, uh, the necessity was to attract in foreign investment and a big part of that was to attract in foreign vulture funds who were increasing in buying up these assets and um, so they brought in those vulture funds they brought in for example the real estate investment trust big investors in private rental provision and they provided a tax exemption to real estate investment trusts in 2013, Michael Noonan, this is a quote from him in the Dáil speaking at the time, who was the Minister for Finance, said, this exemption was brought in to facilitate the attraction of foreign investment capital to the Irish property market. They wanted investors to come in, buy up these distressed assets, the land, um, and take them off the balance sheets of the banks so that the banks then could be sold off and Ireland is deemed in recovery, NAMA could be wound up to show externally to the markets Ireland is a recovery. This was the prioritization, it was a political decision to prioritize, it was a strategy to use what I call a process of refinancialization of Irish housing um, in order to achieve this recovery and of course the crisis results from that. Um, and we see then post, interestingly post 2013, that the narrative shifts and the justification of bringing in investment into property um, rather than the state doing it um, and the justification of this tax break to real estate investment trust is to increase supply because suddenly we have this now this housing crisis around the lack of supply um, and so to, to increase it. But of course, this crisis now is still playing out now in terms of the vulture funds, for example, buying up uh, mortgages, buy to let mortgages, homeowners, renters facing eviction, um, and also the land hoarding is a big issue. NAMA has said publicly that it sold significant amounts of development land that it had. It sold them to investors like Lone Star, um, and they gave specifically land that had the potential to build up to 20,000 housing units, but just 5% of that land has been built on. So we have this process of land hoarding because of these vultures, speculators there for them, their land is an appreciating value and it's an appreciating asset, they're under no pressure to build. Um, I'm just very conscious of my time, so I'm going to move on. Um, to a little bit about homelessness and family hubs. Um, I've, as part of this postdoctoral research I've been engaged in, has been looking at uh, homeless families' experience of this private rental subsidy, the housing assistance payment, um, and the family hubs, the new family hubs that have been developed. We've used what's called a participatory research method, it's based on human rights and capabilities approach, which um, promotes the participation of people who are directly affected by in vulnerability or poverty in the research. Um, we engage them in process of as well, it's about trying to change policy, it's engaging in action, 
Um, so we worked with peer researchers who were formerly homeless, three peer researchers, and we engaged um, a number of up to 12 families in a family hub over a 10 week period where we worked with them each week, we talked to them, we engaged with them, um, developed an understanding of what is the human right to housing, the idea of their rights, and then we tried to work through with them what was their experience of the housing assistance payment. Um, and what we found in that was that these families were being excluded from the private rental sector because they couldn't compete with professionals. And even with having the housing assistance payment subsidy, um, the problem is that the, they were responsible to go out and find the accommodation. So you had these families going out, lining up, for example, with professionals trying to compete and get private rental accommodation. Of course, what uh, is a landlord going to choose? They're going to choose the professional. Um, so they were suffering this exclusion. Travellers in particular also affected, migrants affected as well. Um, and the families felt this stigmatisation that as they were homeless, but also as lone parents and single mothers, that they were being excluded and discriminated against in the market. So this idea of the housing assistance payment as a marketized form of social um, housing or social investment, we see through this participatory research the, the downsides, significant downsides for some of the most excluded um, in society and trying to access. And in contrast, for example, in social housing, traditional social housing, these families wouldn't have faced those levels of discrimination or stigma. The other thing that we were looking at um, was the, oh, sorry, the, oh, there we go. the other issue that was very interesting that came up with in the research was what is called uh, the concept of tenure security. That the families were really reluctant to take, they were really reluctant, they did not want to go into the private rental sector to use the housing assistance payment. Um, and policymakers have talked about this, and we've heard reference in the media. Connor Skeehan from the Housing Agency and others have talked about this, uh, the gaming of the system by families, by homeless families, for example, being offered accommodation, turning it down. But when you actually go in and speak to the families, you see that they don't want uh, housing in the private rental sector. They have suffered, most of them, uh, or a significant proportion, have either suffered the loss of housing uh, from being in the private rental sector, being evicted already, um, or their families have, or they've been lost housing as a result of overcrowding. Um, and they, do, they describe that they do not want to put their children through that trauma anymore. So they, would, they said, we will wait longer in emergency accommodation to get a permanent social housing, or council house, what they call a forever home. Of course, that's portrayed in the media and by policymakers as somehow gaming the system. Whereas in actual fact, if you think about it, um, and particularly uh, myself and Mary Murphy, my colleague in Minutu, have looked at this and uh, you know, analysed it using feminist frameworks and um, what's called a gendered uh, moral rationality, the idea of you know, they're prioritising their children in particular over their needs. Um, and policymakers, we found, were very blind to that, completely ignored that reality. And they, they, they ignored that within the housing assistance payment, that that is a deeply insecure form of housing because you can be evicted quite eas easily. Um, and therefore we would argue that it's not a, it shouldn't be classified as a form of social housing, that it doesn't provide the right to housing to secure tenure. Um, and particularly for homeless families who've already suffered that trauma of losing their home, the idea of having to go back into an insecure form of housing um, can be quite um, terrifying for them and we found that had a significant impact. So that was interesting, an interesting example of what can come true in participatory uh, research or a new knowledge that was created and we co-constructed. The other issue was the family hubs um, and I don't know if you've heard about these family hubs but they're a new form of emergency accommodation um, that were developed from kind of mid last year onwards um, and they, it was in part as a result of the public uh, disquiet around the use of commercial hotels and B&Bs for families and um, these hubs have been developed for kind of 40 to 50 families some of them are in former religious institutions some of them in former warehouses some of them hotels and um, being re, uh, refurbished or reorientated um, and the dominant portrayal again by policymakers and government um, has been that these are a positive development that these give families a chance to recover a chance to um, you know, develop and hopefully get a home. What we found, in fact, that family hubs are in many ways not very different from hotels. In some ways, they're worse than the hotels because at least in the hotels, the families had some autonomy themselves 
to make decisions, to go and come when they please. Whereas in these effective form of institution, they don't have that same freedom. They have to sign in and out, and there's ne necessarily rules and restrictions on, um, for example, for example, family engagement, co-parenting, like for example, not even co-parenting, but families playing with other children, because it's all about child protection, understandably. Um, and so what we found was, and the, the, the families talk about this again, they talked about it, it wasn't actually our intention of the research, but the families at each of the sessions kept talking about their conditions and how they felt. Um, and essentially what we found was that the literature that talks about emergency accommodation and its detrimental impact on families and children, their well-being, we found the same um, processes, the same impacts affecting these families. So essentially we argue then that family hubs should be seen as no different than emergency accommodation. They shouldn't be somehow seen as something better and they will be and are as damaging as any other form of emergency accommodation on families and particularly children. Um, I want to move on now. So, um, oh yeah, the poor value for money. Um, the, the housing assistance payments, we've done some analysis on this um, and it's, it's logical if you think about it. The, in a social housing, traditional social housing building, the state pays money to a private contractor or whoever, and they build a social housing house. It belongs to the state. The state gets rent from the tenant, um, and they have that into perpetuity. They have an asset, and they can also use to borrow off. Um, in the private rental sector, the state is giving money to a landlord. That money is essentially going to the landlord. The landlord accumulates that asset. They accumulate the wealth. Of course, the state is getting a service for that, but it's not accumulating an asset like it does in social housing. Um, and similarly, um, it, it, we've calculated that if you think about the, the terms of the rent that I talked about, that rent, they're paying a significantly higher rent to the private sector than if the state <coughs> built that housing and borrowed it itself. And um, we calculated that you know, over the lifetime, um, over a 30 year period, that the housing assistance payment will be 23 billion more expensive than if the state built that housing itself um, and that it could have provided 87,000 units over that period. But of course, the, the issue is, um, um, the issue is the ideological bias against social housing, essentially. That is why they're not building social housing. There are alternative policies been put forward by many of us, by policymakers, politicians, activists, uh, academics, essentially built around the idea of a rights-based approach to housing and um, that would involve an increase in the amount of state-provided social housing, affordable housing, but using things like cooperatives um, and really countering the idea that the state can't build social housing or there's something inherently wrong with social housing or the state building social housing. Um, and I would argue that we do have to uh, shape and shift in our language and our narrative around it in a way I'd argue that we need to make the case for the state building affordable housing that is rental um, and for purchase um, rather than it seem just as something narrow as social housing, that it should be for a mix of income groups um, and they have made the case it should be a new semi-state uh, affordable homes company set up to build, that it should use the public land to build that rather than, um, the, rather than selling off the public land to public-private partnerships. A rights-based perspective is really important. Seeing housing as a human right, as a need, rather than an asset. Housing policy in Ireland currently doesn't view housing as a human right. Um, we have no right to housing in the constitution. We see politicians using the argument, the, the government and the state and other bodies that, for example, we can't implement stronger tenant protections because it will interfere with the right to private property of landlords. Um, so I think there is a need to look at this and, for example, to have a referendum on the right to housing that would put it in the Constitution. Um, there, in terms of a big question emerges, uh, then my last thing I'm going to look at is... Yeah, um, the big question that's come up then is if we're in four years of a crisis, a deep crisis with so many households affected, why do, have we not seen a protest movement? Why have we not seen, um, a, as I argue, you know, where is the housing bracket water movement? Where is the water movement of housing? And a lot of people are asking this question and academics and um, activists, you know, where, where is the housing movement? 
Um, and of course, it's very complex. There's many reasons. There's no simple explanation. Um, but trying to think through some of them, um, I think there is a clear, uh, as I talked about, that the government has won certain narratives and arguments. For example, the anti-social housing bias <coughs> argument. This idea that the state can't or shouldn't build social housing. That, I would argue, is probably agreed by a lot of people um, at the moment. And this question of nimbyism, of anti-social housing. Um, and we haven't yet convinced enough people the idea that the state can actually build mixed income, well-planned um, estates. The, obviously, the government is captured, or acting on behalf of, a lot of very wealthy financial interests. Um, also the interests of those who have housing to a certain extent. So it's not like water whereby um, it was just a, an entity that had been set up was the, the, of Irish water. They were the only people whose interests were going to be affected. Housing, investment in housing is the asset of the wealthy both in Ireland and internationally and Irish housing is very important. So to change policy in this area requires dealing with that, the interests and the question of power and asserting alternative power. Um, even those who are in mortgage arrears, for example, could be looking at house prices rising and saying, that's benefiting me, I might be, get more for my asset. So this argument of um, this issue of rising house prices and who it benefits, um, and people feeling that they benefit from it. Um, but there is a thing about that, that, if you think about it now, I think the situation is changing because for homeowners, for example, their children now can't access affordable housing. Even students can't access, particularly in the big cities, affordable housing. Um, we have a generation, the generation rent, who can't buy housing, who are stuck in the private rental sector. Um, so I would argue that the crisis has still quite a long way to go, um, and that we're still very much in a situation where competing ideas are open for, um, for uh, different ideas are open, it's not clear as to what it's going to go, and I would argue that the idea of the right to housing could connect a lot of people. Um, that aren't being connected at the moment. And part of the issue has been that, um, and what I want to say is, is it, the starting um, point when you say that, um, you know, where is the housing protest, are, is that there actually has been a lot of housing protest. It's taking qu place at quite a local level. Um, but if we look at, for example, Apollo House, that was a very significant action. Um, um, a direct action taking over a building, hundreds of people involved. You know, there was opinion polls done on, on uh, various media showed the majority of Irish people supported it. Um, we have had a, a new National Housing and Homeless Coalition that's organising a protest on April the 7th in Dublin, has organised a number of protests. We have the emergence of new forms of solidarity like the Inner City Helping Homeless in Dublin, um, Focus Ireland services, also online campaigns like Uplift highlighting around vultures. We have a bill being promoted by what's called the Right to Homes group, which the, the master of the, uh, Ed Honan, uh, a judge who's been involved in writing a, a housing bill at the moment that's been put forward to buy up vulture funds and um, buy up the mortgage and arrears from vulture funds through setting up a housing co-op. We had the left political parties put forward a, a, a motion in the doll around the right to housing. So I would argue that we actually have had um, significant housing protests. It hasn't been like the water movement, but I think that there, there are a lot of um, these activities taking place, but there are a lot of challenges to developing, or developing solidarity around the issue of housing. Um, so I think it's very much a story that still has to run. And I'll finish there. <laughs>